Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Robert Sedlak. I'm one of the staff gastroenterologists here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And uh, what I'm going to speak about is uh, some of the research I've been doing over the past few years, in particular how it pertains to uh, education in endoscopy. Since the 90s, most gastroenterology uh, uh, professional societies have recommended 140 colonoscopies to be performed before a fellow can be assessed for competence. As educators, uh, over the past uh, decade or two, we've felt that this is likely uh, insufficient uh, training, and our, but unfortunately there has been no uh, reliable way to measure competence uh, or benchmarks to set to what defines competence. So we undertook a uh, uh, project to uh, try to define both what the learning curves for colonoscopy are and a better way of assessing and defining competence. So the goal of our study was to define specific core cognitive and motor skills required for colonoscopy and determine the average learning curve required to achieve these benchmarks. From this we'll be able to establish uh, performance thresholds that would define minimal competence in colonoscopy uh, and the amount of training required to reach these benchmarks. We performed a three-year study at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, where staff were asked to grade each fellow's performance on every colonoscopy performed in our routine endoscopy suites using a Mayo Clinic uh, colonoscopy skills assessment tool, abbreviated MCSAT. To assess a trainee's skills, the assessment tool is completed by the supervising staff immediately following each colonoscopy in which a fellow participated. This form evaluates 12 separate motor and cognitive skills uh, critical to colonoscopy. In addition, uh, the final two survey items uh, graded a fellow's overall motor and cognitive competence as well. These two items are, act as anchors for the other 12 survey items in our analysis, and we'll uh, which we'll discuss more in a moment. Each item was graded on a four-point scale and performance expectations for each item and score were spelled out on the actual assessment form uh, to ensure all staff were using the same scoring standards. As a side note, this validation of this assessment uh, tool was published in GI Endoscopy this past December, and I invite anyone who wants to learn more about the actual form itself uh, to uh, uh, view this publication. During this three-year three study, we had 41 different fellows perform over 10,000 colonoscopies, uh, of which over 6,000 of these colonoscopies were performed in the routine endoscopy suites and formed the basis of our analysis. The assessment form was completed on over 4,100 of these procedures uh, by 58 different staff. From this collected data, we were able to plot the average scores for each core skill uh, for these 41 fellows at the different stages of training. So as depicted in this graph, we show five core motor skills uh, that were graded on the four-point scale described. The x-axis depicts how many procedures have been performed, and each of these numbers represent the average score of the 10 procedures before and after each stage. For example, procedure number 50 uh, is actually encompasses uh, procedures number 41 through 60. The y-axis represents the average score for the procedures at each stage. Similarly, on this next graph, we see the curves for the two anchor assessment questions of overall hands-on and cognitive skills. The error bars represent the 95% confidence interval for the scores at each stage. These learning curves I've shown demonstrate that a fellow's development generally progresses along at a certain rate, but it tells us nothing about the uh, set, nothing about where to set the minimal competency bar. In this next diagram, uh, you'll see the distribution curves of two different groups of fellows. If you recall those t final two anchor survey items, assessing the overall hands-on and cognitive competence, we use those to break the fellows' respective motor and cognitive scores into a competent group and a non-competent group. A score of one, two, or three on these final two questions demonstrate that the trainee is progressing towards competence but has not yet achieved overall motor or cognitive competence, while a score of four would indicate the staff deem them competent based on their displayed performance during that procedure. So a score of one, two, or three on those overall scores would end up on the blue dotted line, where a score of four would uh, make up the group uh, for the distribution curve of the solid red line. From the distributions of these scores for 
the particular assessment item shown here, in, in this case loop reduction techniques, uh, we've plotted it as two separate curves. The blue dotted line you'll see the, the individual may have scored a four for a particular case. The, it is all part of the blue dotted line. Their overall hands-on score was all, uh, one, two, or three. In contrast, the red solid line represents the distribution scores for this loop reduction item for those who received a four on the overall hands-on skills. So even though they're, they may have scored a three in loop reduction, they uh, were deemed competent based on their overall uh, skill scores. Using these two distribution curves, the contrasting groups method defines the minimal competence score as the score along the x-axis where a vertical line projects down from the intersection of these two curves. In this case, a score of 3.4. By repeating these for the other assessment items, you can uh, see the results on this table shown. The first, or the middle column, demonstrates the uh, actual results from our uh, contrasting groups method. The average MCSAT score for each item ranged from 3.38 to 3.5, while the sequel intubation time was shown to be 16.2 uh, minutes or less. Finally, a sequel intubation rate of 85% uh, was found to be the uh, threshold for competence. To simplify the practical application of these metrics, we uh, rounded these up towards the more conservative end of these range. You'll see in the final column uh, the average MSAT score uh, for each item was rounded to 3.5. Therefore, uh, any score of 3.5 in any of the parameters would meet or exceed the identified minimal competency uh, threshold identified by the contrasting groups method. Similarly, a sequel intubation time of 16 minutes and sequel intubation rate of 85% were used as thresholds. Going back and applying these to our learning curves that we uh, previously showed, we find that it takes roughly 275 procedures to consistently achieve a sequel intubation of rate of 85% or greater as shown in this graph. Similarly, reaching the cecum in 16 minutes or less also occurred around 275 procedures uh, as shown. And finally, with the learning curves of those five motor skills that we previously showed, it isn't until 275 procedures again that the average fellow achieves the MCSAT scores of 3.5 or greater for all the cognitive and motor skills assessed. Now, 275 procedures is simply the volume required by the average fellow to reach these uh, competence benchmarks. This is not to say some may not achieve these benchmarks sooner or some even later. A few of our fastest fellows uh, were able to reach and maintain scores above these benchmarks as early as 200 procedures, while some of the slower learners took as many as 400 procedures to accomplish this. It should be noted, however, that no fellow achieved competence by 140 procedures, which would corroborate the recent findings by Spear out of the University of Wisconsin. Instead, it takes significantly more than current GI training recommendations and far exceeds even lower recommendations used by other specialties uh, in training colonoscopy. In summary, we've defined a means to perform a true continuous uh, performance-based assessment of colonoscopy and established benchmarks required uh, to achieve minimal competence. The obvious implications are that as many educators have long suspected, it takes many more than 140 procedures to acquire the requisite cognitive and motor skills uh, to perform a safe and, safe and effective colonoscopic exam. As a result, the ASGE is currently rewriting many of the training and assessment guidelines for colonoscopy. What it also means is that colonoscopy training outside of GI also needs to reassess their goals, methods, and durations of training. Ideally, all training programs, regardless of their specialty, uh, should use performance-based assessment methods like the ones we have discussed and competency standards should conform to a single set of metrics that will guarantee that all trainees aspiring to perform colonoscopy are competent to perform an effective and safe exam.